Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the all new ASUS NUC Pro. And if you're familiar with the older Intel NUCs, you know that Intel themselves used to release these mini PCs. Unfortunately, that division in Intel has kind of closed down, but they passed the torch over to ASUS. So we've got a real NUC branded unit here. The overall design of the Pro models definitely stays true to the original design of the NUC, but they've also got kind of a more modern line. And those for some people are more aesthetically pleasing because they're kind of silver and whites more lighter. But I really do like the Pros here. Just gives me that industrial vibe. And that's something I really like with these little PCs. ASUS has changed a lot with these NUCs. We've actually got a new cooling system, a brand new chip, new case design, got that honeycomb on the side, which I think looks pretty good here. We still got Thunderbolt 4, and they're offering a few different CPU variants, plus two different sizes like Intel used to do with their NUCs. I've got the tall version here, which means we can actually store a 2.5 inch SSD in the bottom, or you could go with the thin version, which won't allow you to have an extra drive, but everything else there should be exactly the same. Inside of the box, along with the 14 Pro, we get our mounting plate with some hardware. This will allow us to kind of mount it to the back of a monitor, under a desk, on a wall, basically wherever you want. We also get our 120 watt power supply, and this is something that's changed quite a bit. It's a much smaller power supply, but it's still putting out 120 watts. It's coming in at about half the size of the old power supply that came with those NUCs. And when it comes to I.O. on this new unit, up front we've got one USB Type-C, and this is USB 3.2, so it will do display out. We've also got two full-size USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, and of course our power button. Not much going on around the sides, but we've got plenty of ventilation with that new honeycomb design. And around back, we've got our power input, dual HDMI ports, and these are HDMI 2.1. We've got another USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A port, USB 2.0, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, and dual Thunderbolt 4. So we could connect an eGPU to this or add some really fast storage. Another thing they've implemented here is a toolless design, so it makes it really easy to get in. It's got a little locking mechanism. We can actually just pop this right off, and now we can access the internals. Makes it really easy to get in here and upgrade the RAM, add some extra storage. And since we've got the tall version, this does support a 2.5 inch drive right in the bottom there. And the bottom plate is also gonna act as our heat sink for those M.2 drives. 2.5 will go right underneath everything, just kind of slots right up in there. And as you can see, we've got dual SODIMM RAM. This does utilize DDR5, a 2280 M.2 NVMe SSD. It's a Gen 4 drive. And we've also got another spot in here to add an extra drive, but that's a 2242, still Gen 4. But one thing they've changed here is the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip is now soldered to the board. This has Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.3, but in the older versions, we could definitely swap that out. Now we really can't because it's soldered to the main board. Like I mentioned, ASUS will be offering a few different CPU variants with this Nook 14 Pro, but the one we have here has the Intel Core Ultra 7 165H. This is something we actually haven't tested on the channel yet. Very familiar to the 155H here, but with this configuration, we get six performance cores up to five gigahertz, eight efficiency cores up to 3.8, and two low power efficiency cores up to 2.5. We've also got that built-in Intel AI Boost NPU. So we've got that neural processing unit up to 1.4 gigahertz. Built-in Intel Arc iGPU up to 2.3 gigahertz. This will support up to 48 gigabytes of DDR5 at 5600 running in dual channel. I've got a 16 gigabyte model here. Lots of storage options, one 2242 and a 2.5 inch drive with the tall version. Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.3, and this is running Windows 11. First thing I wanted to give you a look at here was the BIOS, and we're back to that good old NUC BIOS. I've always loved the look of this. Uh, main page here, just all the information about the unit. Advanced. Adjust video memory. Mess around with all of the USB on the unit. Storage support, MEBX. Power, performance, and cooling. Right now, we're kind of in automatic mode, and this will do up to around 45 watts. At least that's what ASUS has stated. Dynamic PL1 support is enabled. And right here, it's saying that our package power limit one sustained is 64. This is not enabled right now, but we can enable this user define. And now we would be at 64 Watts. And this is what I want to do. I actually want to leave it here. And what I'm going to do is actually take this time on up, even though PL1 and PL2 is at 64. 
We can set up a custom curve, automatic fan control, and I'm gonna leave it just like this. I wanna get that boost so we can get those clocks on that CPU and GPU. But yeah, everything's here from the old Intel NUC BIOS, and I really do like the way this is set up. So jumping right into Windows, I've been doing a little testing so far, and this Ultra 7 165H really does perform very well as an everyday desktop chip. I mean, this is going to handle everything you want to throw at it. 16 gigs of DDR5 in dual channel. I probably should have upgraded this to 32, but I wanted to test it like it came out of the box. We've also got that Intel Arc i GPU, and of course the Intel NPU or the Intel AI Boost NPU. So we've got that neural processing unit here. And to tell you the truth, I haven't really messed around with this that much. We can definitely get in and generate some images and things like that, but I've been waiting on a real good benchmark for these MPUs to hit the market. Something that we can test on all of the PCs that come out in the future. Like we saw, TDP is fully adjustable from that BIOS, and I've taken it up to 64 watt from CPU-Z. And you can see right over here, we're at 64 watts. I gotta say, this has a pretty decent cooler on it. I'm pretty sure they've upgraded this. It's got a thicker fin array on it, so it is absorbing a lot more heat. That fan does ramp up once we hit around 85 degrees Celsius, but the sound isn't that bad. You could max this out at 100% if you wanted to keep it nice and cool, but it will get loud that way. Checking out some web browsing here, we've got Wi-Fi 6, but one thing I didn't like about the way it was designed is it's actually soldered to the board, and we've been seeing this quite a bit in these newer PCs. But it would have been nice to have that upgradable uh, Wi-Fi chip. That way we could have went to Wi-Fi 7 down the road. And remember, we've got that 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port around back if you wanted to go that route. But uh, right now we are on Wi-Fi 6. Web pages load up really quickly. And another thing I always like to test is some 4K video playback. So we'll head in here. We'll just get right into it. Stats for nerds. And I'm actually going to reset this. So we're going to go to 1440. Then we'll go back up to 4K just so we can reset that viewpoint frames counter up top. And just like most of the chips that Intel has released in the past few years with integrated graphics, even lower end like the 4105, we're seeing some great 4K video playback. Streaming, native, you want to use something like Netflix, it's going to work out just fine. I'm using the Chrome browser right now. Top left hand corner, stats for nerds zero drop frames and I can move right over to something else. On the initial load up, you might see a couple dropped ones and that's normal even with high-end systems with dedicated GPUs. But yeah, 4K video playback on this 165H is great and I kind of expected it would be. So far, not bad at all using this as an everyday desktop system. Web browsing, email checking, document editing, you could get some light photo editing and even some light video editing out of the way on this system. Very snappy experience, but the next thing I wanted to take a look at were some benchmarks, and then we're going to move over to some gaming. I'm really interested to see what this iGPU can do. And the first benchmark we have here is Geekbench 6. I was actually expecting a little more out of this chip, especially given the fact that we took it up to 65 watts. Single core, 2,141, and I'm not calling it a slouch at all. I just figured we'd see a little higher on that single, and especially on that multi, given we've got 16 cores and 22 threads. Next thing I ran here were some GPU benchmarks using 3D Mark. Night Raid coming in with a 26,402. Fire Strike, 6,952. And with Fire Strike here, I've seen up in the 8,000s on the 155H. And even that was at a 65 watt TDP. But I understand that, you know, different manufacturers will allow that GPU to boost up higher or lower, depending on what kind of load is put on it. And that's kind of been a weird thing with these new Intel Ultra chips. It really feels like they don't want to let that GPU boost up all the way. And the final one here is Time Spy with a pretty impressive 3480. Now I've seen these Intel Ultra chips benchmark really well with synthetics, but then when you get into real world gaming, it's just not kind of putting out that performance that you'd kind of expect looking at these benchmarks. So let's go ahead and test out some real world games. Here's Spider-Man Remastered at 900p low with XESS set to balance. If you're not familiar with XESS, this is Intel scaling technology, just like FSR. It does work out pretty well on their higher end dedicated GPUs, but I haven't seen great performance from these Arc i GPUs. But I gotta say, with the latest driver updates for these Arc i GPUs, I'm seeing much better performance, at least with this game so far. So let's move over to an older one and see what happens here. We've got Fallout 4. 1080p low. 
Everything's looking pretty decent. I figured we'd actually be much higher than we are right now. We're seeing an average of around 68, but once I get into a little bit of a firefight here, you'll see it drop down under 60. Now there's one thing I'd like you to keep your eye on with every one of these games that I test, and that's gonna be the GPU clock. Up in the top left-hand corner, I've got Afterburner running. This should be able to boost up to 2.3 gigahertz on that iGPU, but most of the time we're under 1600 megahertz. And that's something I've been seeing across the board with all of these Ultra chips. And like I mentioned earlier, it just really seems like they don't want that thing to boost up all the way. And I know that for a laptop, we don't want to be drawn so much power, but we're working with a mini PC here plugged into the wall. So taking that clock up shouldn't hurt battery life at all. With Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 900p low, we only averaged 55 FPS. Here's Forza Horizon 5. This is actually a really easy game to run. It's very well optimized, and right now we're at 1080 low. We do get really close to going under 60 in some situations, but for the most part we're over that, and we averaged 81 FPS. And finally, Cyberpunk 2077, and this is one that's given Intel Arc a real run for its money, especially on the iGPUs. 900p low, XESS set to performance. And again, that GPU clock is just really low. And even if I was to take this down to 720p, we're sitting at the same average, around 55 FPS. First impressions here when it comes to performance. Now, if you were just picking this up for everyday tasks or even work where you just need to be online, checking emails and things like that, yeah, it's gonna work out. I personally wouldn't pick this up for gaming. And of course we do have Thunderbolt 4 here, so we could easily connect an eGPU. And if that's a video you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below. Next up, we've got the overall design. Definitely Nook style here with the Asus branding, which is not bad. I do like the side panels here. Very small form factor, it's a sleek mini PC. Fan noise isn't as bad as I thought it would be, and with the older Nooks, they used to scream. Sometimes they'd sound like jet engines. The new cooling system that Asus has implemented works much better than the older version, and even at 65 watts, this thing isn't screaming like the old ones used to. Personally, I've really been rooting for these Ultra chips, but you know, they've been out long enough, we should have seen a nice increase in iGPU performance by now. So, you know, if you're looking for a mini PC for gaming, this is definitely not the one for you. If you're looking for something to replace a big desktop for work, then yeah, this would work for you. But that's gonna wrap it up for this first look video. If you're interested in learning a little more, I'll leave some links down below. And if there's anything else you wanna see running on this, just let me know in the comments. But like always, thanks for watching.